In today's video, I'm gonna go through SAT practice test five's math no calculator section. I've scored perfectly on back-to-back -back SAT math sections. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how to efficiently solve each and every problem so that you can improve on your next SAT. So with all that being said, make sure to like and subscribe and let's go ahead and get started with number one. All right, so number one says, which of the following is an equation of line L in the XY plane? So as you can see, we have a Y intercept at one. The only, the only answer choice with a Y intercept of one is answer choice D. So D will be our correct answer there. Moving over to number two, we have the circle above with center O has a circumference of 36. What is the length of minor arc AC? Well, minor arc AC is going to be this length right here. Now we see since we have a 90 degree angle there, we know that 90 degrees is going to be one fourth of that full circle because 90 degrees over 360 degrees is one fourth. Therefore, we take that one fourth, we multiply it then by the total circumference of 36, and we're going to end up getting nine as our answer for the minor arc AC. So our answer will be A. All right, moving on to number three. What are the solutions to the quadratic equation 4x squared minus 8x minus 12? In this case, what we can do is we can go ahead and sub we can go ahead and factor out a 4 since 4 is a factor in 4, 8, and 12. So we'll have 4 times x squared minus 2x and then minus 3 is equal to 0. From there, we can go ahead and factor into 4 times x minus 3 times x plus 1 equals zero. And then from there, we can go ahead and solve for what our solutions will be. So we know our solutions then are going to equal x, uh, x equaling three, and then also x equaling negative one. Therefore, our answer is going to be answer choice B. Okay, x equals negative one and x equals three. All right, from there, we can go ahead and move on to number four. So which of the following is an example of a function whose graph in the xy plane has no x-intercepts? So we're never crossing through that x-axis at all. So option A, a linear function whose rate of change is not zero, that's incorrect because if we were to draw that out, it looks something like this, right? And we'd have it going like that, and eventually it's gonna cross through that x-axis. Option B, a quadratic function with real zeros. Real zeros means that it's crossing the x-axis or at least touching it at some point. Okay, so it would have an x-intercept. So answer choice B is incorrect. Answer choice C, a quadratic function with no real zeros. That'll be correct. A quadratic function with no, with no real zeros means that it never has an x-intercept. Okay, and then answer choice D, a cubic polynomial with at least one real zero. One real zero means that it will cross the x-axis at some point. All right, next up we've got answer, or I'm sorry, question number five. In the equation above, k is a constant. If x is nine, what is the value of k? All right, in this case, we'll go ahead and plug in nine for x. Then I'm gonna go ahead and add nine to each side, right? That way I can isolate that square root and square root each side, or I'm sorry, square each side. So now we have nine is gonna equal the square root of k plus two. From here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and square each side, so that way I can isolate k and solve. Nine squared will give me 81. 81 then will equal k plus two. All I gotta do is subtract two from each side, and I'm gonna end up with k is equal to 79. Keep in mind, I always wanna make sure that I'm paying attention to what I'm asked to answer with. In this case, it is simply the value of k, which we have determined is 79, so our answer will be D. All right, moving on to number six. Number six says, which of the following is equivalent to the sum of the expressions a squared minus one and a plus one? All right, so I'm just adding these two together. So I'll just put a plus sign there. All right, well, I see I've got negative one plus one, so I'm gonna have no constant. So anything with a constant, I can get rid of. So I can get rid of B. I'm gonna have A squared then plus A will be my final answer. So my answer there is going to be answer choice A. All right, moving on, we got question number seven. So Jackie has two summer jobs. She works as a tutor, which pays $12 per hour, and she works as a lifeguard, which pays $9.50 an hour. She can work no more than 20 hours per week but she wants to earn at least at least $220 per week. Which of the following systems of inequalities represents the situation in terms of X and Y, where X is the number of hours she tutors and Y is the number of hours she works as a lifeguard? All right, first thing right away I'm looking for is for 220 to be less than or equal to her total compensation, right? So her total compensation has to be greater than or equal to 220, which is not true in answer choice A and B. As we can see, that shows um, 220 being greater than her compensation, okay? We need 220 to be less than or equal to her compensation, therefore A and B are incorrect. Between C and D then, I'm looking for X plus Y, which is gonna represent the total hours that she works, to be less than 20 as it is in C, okay? It says she doesn't wanna work any more than 20 hours per week. Therefore, the answer has to be C. Answer choice D shows the total hours she's working to be greater than or equal to 20, which is incorrect. So correct answer there for number seven is gonna be C. All right, moving on to number eight. So we've got an air, the speed of sound S in meters per second is a linear function of the air temperature 
T in degrees Celsius and is given by S of T equals 0 0.6 T plus 331.4. Which of the following statements is the best interpretation of the number 331.4 in this context? Well, that's going to be our y-intercept where our degree Celsius, which is our T, is zero. So that's going to be the speed then of sound when the air temperature is zero degrees Celsius will be 331.4. So our answer here is going to be the speed of sound in meters per second at zero degrees Celsius. That's where that y-intercept is. So our answer there is going to be A. All right, let's go ahead and do number nine. So we have if x, y is a solution to the system of equations above and x is greater than zero, what is the value of x times y? So in this case, since I'm told that y is x squared, I can go ahead and plug that in. So I'll have two times x squared then, which will give me two x squared plus six is equal to, and then I'm gonna go ahead and distribute my two to my x and then also to my three. So that's gonna give me two x plus six. All right, from there, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and subtract six from each side because I wanna get all my x's on the same side. That's going to leave me with 0 and 0, and then I'm going to go ahead and subtract 2x from each side as well. Now at this point, I've got 2x squared minus 2x is equal to 0. From here, I can factor out a 2x, so I'll have a 2x times an x, and then um, that'll be minus 1, okay? It will be set equal to 0. Now keep in mind, x has to be greater than 0, so in this case, I have to take my x minus 1, my x minus 1, and I'll erase some of this up top so you can see better. I'm going to take my x minus 1, I'm going to set that equal to 0. That's going to end up giving me my x value of 1, okay? From here, I know that y is equal to x squared. So y is equal to x squared. I know that x is 1. 1 squared will also equal 1. Therefore, x times y is 1 times 1, which will give me 1 as my answer. My answer will be a. All right, moving on to number 10. If a squared plus b squared equals z and a times b equals 9, which of the following is equivalent to 4z plus 8y? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in a squared plus b squared in for this z next to this 4. So I'm going to have 4 times a squared plus b squared. Keep in mind, i got to distribute the 4 to the a squared as well as the b squared. And then I've got plus 8 times y. I know y is ab, so that'll be plus 8ab. All right, when I go ahead and fill this all out, I'm going to have 4a squared plus 4b squared plus 8ab, which you should be able to recognize from this then that our answer is going to have to be answer choice B. Now, the reason you should be able to recognize this is because we have our term with our both our variables, A and B, is double our term with our A squared and with our B squared. So this should remind you of the fact that if you were to do x plus y squared, that it's going to end up equaling x squared and y squared plus 2xy. Okay, It should remind you of this pattern. So from that then, we can go ahead and determine that we're going to have this 2a times another 2a gives us 4a squared, 2b times another 2b gives us that 4b squared, and then we have to take that 2, multiply it by our x and our y, which will end up giving us 2 times 2a, which is 4a, and then times 2b as well, which will give us that 8ab. So our answer there is going to be b. As we can see with a, we're not going to end up getting um, 4a squared because we'd have a squared there, and then with c and d, we're going to end up getting a 16a squared in both of those, which is why they'll be wrong as well. With that being said, we can go ahead and move on to number 11. All right, the volume of right circular cylinder A is 22 cubic centimeters. What is the volume in cubic centimeters of a right circular cylinder with twice the radius and half the height of cylinder A? Well, what we have to keep in mind here is with volume of a right circular cylinder, we know that that's going to be pi r squared for the face of that cylinder, right? The face being that right there. Then we got to multiply by the height as well, and that's going to give us the volume, so times height. Well, if we were to do half the height, okay, so we got volume equals pi, and then we also have twice the radius. We have to keep in mind that if we're doubling the radius, that's getting squared, okay? And then we're doing half the height. So keep in mind, since the radius is getting squared, what we're going to end up with then would be pi, and then we're going to have double, right? Because since the radius is squared, we're going to end up with times 4 and then times a half. So we see that we're going to end up doubling our volume. So our volume in total then is going to be answer choice C of 44. Okay, Because we're doubling the radius and that's getting squared, that's equivalent to a quadruple. And then when we have the height, that's just 4 times 1 half. We see that our total volume is going to double then. So our answer there will be C. All right, moving on to 12. Which of the following is equivalent to 9 to the power of 3 fourths? Keep in mind our denominator and our exponent is going to be what we are taking as our root. And then that 3, which is our numerator, is what we're going to put in with our variable, which in this case is 9. So it'll be 9 to the third power beneath that fourth root. Now, the way that you solve this question, since obviously none of your answer choices in A through D match what we just put down on our paper, the way you solve this is by understanding that 9 is the same as 3 squared. OK, 
Okay, nine is the same as three squared. So we're gonna put three squared raised to the power of three. Now, when you have an exponent raised to another exponent, you multiply them. So three squared raised to the power of three is the same as three to the power of six. So three to the power of six. Now from here, you can go ahead and pull out a three. So you can pull out a three and then you're left with the fourth root of three squared, which you can simplify it down to three times the square root of three, okay? Because three squared with the fourth root, we could rewrite that as three and then times three to the power of two over four, which we know is the same as three, I'm gonna move it down here, which we know is the same as three times three to the power of one half, which is three times the square root of three. Answer there is gonna be D for number 12. All right, moving on to number 13. 13 sounds kind of weird, but believe me, it is pretty simple. All right, so we have at a restaurant, n, n cups of tea are made by adding t tea bags to hot water. If t is equal to n plus two, how many additional tea bags are needed to make each additional cup of coffee, or I'm sorry, cup of tea? Key thing here is just looking at the relationship between variables. If we want one more cup of tea, how many more um, tea bags are we gonna need, okay? Um, so how many additional tea bags are needed to make an additional cup of tea? We see it's a one-to-one -one ratio, so the answer there is gonna be one, right? If we want one more cup of tea, we need one more tea bag. If we want one more tea bag, we need one more cup of tea. All right, so our answer there is gonna be B, which is one. All right, number 14. All right, the function is defined by the equation above, which of the following is the graph of y equals negative f of x in the xy plane. All right, there's one way that you can really easily solve this, and I'm gonna go ahead and show it to you. So keep in mind, all you're doing is basically flipping the y-coordinate, okay? So whatever the y-coordinate would be, take it, make it negative. In this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the y-intercept to solve this very fast. We've got two to the power of x. Well, my y-intercept um, is where x is zero. So I've got two to the power of zero plus one. Keep in mind, any number except for zero, raised to the power of zero, so you could have three to the power of zero, four to the power of zero, whatever it is, any number that's not zero raised to the power of zero is one. So it's gonna be one plus one equals two. Keep in mind, we have it negative f of x, so our y-intercept here is gonna be negative two. So negative two is gonna be our y-intercept. I look for my equation, or my graph that has that, and there's only one, so my answer there is gonna be C. All right, so that's a pretty quick way to go ahead and solve number 14. All right, number 15. Alan drives an average of 100 miles each week. His car can travel an average of 25 miles per gallon of gasoline. Alan would like to reduce his weekly expenditure on gasoline by $5. Assuming gasoline costs $4 per gallon, which equation can Alan use to determine how many fewer miles M he should drive each week? Key thing here, we want to use canceling units to make sure we're solving this correctly. So since we're multiplying by miles, what we want to have is we want to have the cost per mile. Okay, so we want to have cost per mile. Then we multiply it by miles. Then we're left with our savings, which we want to be $5. Okay, we want to save $5 each week. Thus, we want our cost savings to equal five. So since we're multiplying by miles here, we're going to take our cost of $4 per gallon, and that's got to be in that numerator. So we can go ahead and get rid of A, get rid of B. We see in C and D, they both have that $4, which is our cost per mile, that 25 miles per gallon, then multiplied by the number of miles. Now, the key part that makes D correct is it's set to the amount that we want to save each week of $5. Therefore, our answer for 15 is D. All right, moving on, we've got the free response section now. So we got question 16. Maria plans to rent a boat. The boat rental costs $60 per hour, and she will have to pay for a water safety course that costs $10. She wants to spend no more than $280 for the rental and the course. If the boat rental is available only for a whole number of hours, what's the maximum number of hours Maria can rent the boat? Well, we have to keep in mind we have a $10 boater safety fee uh, or bo boater safety course. And then we also have 60 bucks per hour. So this will be our inequality, 60H plus 10. We can go ahead and subtract 10 from each side and we're gonna end up getting 270. Has to be greater than or equal to 60H. From there, we divide each side by 60. Dividing each, by, each side by 60 here is gonna give us a little bit over four. Okay, so it'll be something a little bit over four, but we can't quite get to five. And because we can't get to five, our answer has to be four because we can only rent for a whole number of hours. So correct answer for 16 will be four. Number 17, what value of P is the solution to the equation above? In this case, what we have to do is we just gotta get all our P's on one side. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're gonna have two P uh, and then plus two. And then over here, we're gonna have plus eight P minus eight. So two P plus two plus eight P minus eight is gonna equal five P. From here, like I said, we wanna get all our P's on one side. So we'll go ahead and do that. We'll have 10 P. And then we're gonna go ahead and subtract 5p from each side. 
subtract 5p, that's going to leave us with 5p. And then we got plus 2 and minus 8, which was minus 6, is equal to 0. We can go ahead and add 6 to each side now. When we add 6 to each side, we'll have 5p is equal to 6. From there, what we can do is go ahead and divide each side by 5 to solve for p. So we'll go ahead and do that. Dividing each side by 5 gives us p is equal to 6 over 5. So 6 fifths is what will be our answer for number 17. All right, moving on to number 18. The system of equations above has a solution x, y. What is the value of x? Keep in mind we want to solve for x first rather than solving for y because that's the quickest way to solve this question. So let's go ahead and plug in the fact that y equals 2x. We'll plug that in for y, get rid of y. So now we have 1 half then multiplied by 2x plus 2x, which is the same as 4x. And then that's going to be set equal to 21 over 2. From here, we have half of 4x will leave us with 2x. So now we have 2x equals 21 over 2. From there, we multiply each side uh, by 2. Or you can divide 21 over 2 by 2. It doesn't matter. In this case, we'll go ahead and multiply each side by 2. So we'll have 2 times 2x. That's going to give us 4x equals 21. From here, all we got to do is divide each side by 4. So 4x equals 21. Divide each side by 4. And now we have solved for x x will equal 21 over 4. Keep in mind, we always got to pay close attention to what we're asked to answer with. In this case, it's only x, not x plus 1 or x plus 3 or anything like that. All right, moving on to question 19 now. So we have the expression above is equivalent to a over x plus 2 squared, where a is a positive constant and x can't equal negative 2. What's the value of a? Key thing here, we can go ahead and write in our, our answer here. And then we got to get that common denominator so we can subtract these fractions. So to get the common denominator, what we have to do is we have to multiply our 2 by x plus 2. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit here so you can see. We're going to go x plus 2 over x plus 2. Okay, at this point now, what we've got is a common denominator. So from here, we can go ahead and distribute this 2. We're going to have 2x then minus 2x. So that's going to get rid of our x. And then we'll have 6 minus 2 times 2, which will give us 6 minus 4 thus leaving us with 2 is equal to a. So our answer there is going to be 2 for number 19. All right, moving on to number 20 here. We've got intersecting lines R, S, and T are shown below. What is the value of x? All right, so all we got to do here is solve for x. I see I've got to find this angle here that I'm marking in blue in order to solve for x. So what I'm going to do then is I've got 106 along this line S. So I know I have to have 180 degrees along this semicircle. So along here, I've got to have 180 degrees. Therefore, I've got to have 74 right there. Next thing I can do is go ahead and add 74 and 23 together. And that is going to end up giving me 97. So I'm going to go ahead and do 180 minus 97 because I know all my angles and triangle have to add to 180. That's going to go ahead and leave me with 83 as this angle here. Okay, so now that I've solved for that, I know that along this semicircle right here, I have to have 180 degrees. Therefore, I can do 180 degrees minus 83 degrees, thus leaving me with 97 degrees as angle x. So my answer for the value of x will be 97. Hopefully this video is helpful. If it was, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. In addition to that, if you're gaining value from my channel, please consider donating so I can continue to produce these videos for free to everyone around the world. In addition to that, if you're looking for private SAT tutoring, college essay editing, or college admissions consulting, be sure to check out my website.